up. Right now he's Roma doing Terry Funk in a violent elbow. Sends him right out of the ring. Hello everybody, we're back once again with another shoot interview. Today we have the infamous Gary Michael Capetta. Uh, for most of you should know since you bought this video on our website that Mr. Capetta has written a book entitled Body Slams. And this uh, video is uh, meant to supplement that, that book that I hope you already have in your hands. So I'm stuck on the word infamous. <laughs> Where the hell did that come from? Well, it's, it's all relative in wrestling. There you go. Uh, we always start off by asking how you got involved in this crazy sport. Oh man, never could happen today. It, um, I was 21 years old, 1974. Um, I, had, I couldn't afford to get, go to the matches. I had been a fan since I was a little kid. And as a little kid, I thought this was something. When I came, when I was turning the channels and I came across the pro wrestling show, I thought uh, this isn't something that a kid should be watching. I mean, this, this looked a little pornographic to me. Had these two guys that were rolling around in the middle of a, of a mat in their underwear and they're sweating and people are cheering. Um, put that in the mind of a 10 year old. Remember, no music, black and white, and, uh, and smoky arena. Mm -hmm. And uh, when mom would come into the room, I'd turn it off. And then the next week, next Saturday, I remember, I remember that all week. And I was like, what the heck was that? You know, it was on my television. And I, I tuned in the next week and uh, I took a look at it. And this time there were two women doing this with bathing suits. I'm saying, holy cow, mom would walk in, I'd turn it off. Next week, midgets were doing the same damn thing. And I thought, I don't care who knows, I'm going to watch this, there's something here. So I started going to the matches. Um, as, as Whatever anyone would bring me, uh, I would go with my cousin. And so, uh, with time, after years, uh, I was in college, and I, there came a time where I couldn't afford to go to the matches anymore. I had a car, and I had insurance, and I thought there has to be a way for me to be able to get into these matches for free. And... Um, I knew I couldn't wrestle. I wasn't big enough. I didn't want to, the abuse that those referees were taking, no way. And I didn't even think of announcing. I just thought, I can write. And I can write for those magazines. So I lived in New Jersey, went into New York City to the Ring Wrestling Magazine um, editorial office, which it doesn't exist anymore. But um, there was a fellow there. I talked to him into giving me a press pass. I started writing for the magazine for three months. And after three months, I'm sitting in Wildwood, New Jersey at the convention hall. And it's a, a summer resort that held weekly wrestling cards um, throughout the summer. This was the end of June. And um, the week before the 4th of July, big show. And they didn't have an announcer. And it could never happen today. It should never happen in the logical, sane world. But I volunteered. I volunteered. And that was my first re uh, announcing experience of 11 years with the WWF. At the time, the WWWF. So to answer your question directly, I volunteered. Mm -hmm. They didn't have an announcer. And uh, the, guy, I, the guy, I was wearing jeans and a t-shirt, and the guy said, well, you can't get in the ring tonight, but just sit at ringside and just you know, say whatever you want to say. Mm -hmm. And I did. And at the end of the night, he came up to me and he said, hey, that was pretty good, kid. And he, this, this is Willie Gilsenberg. He called me kid for the next 11 years. He said, that was pretty good, kid. He said, uh, do you have any experience doing that? And I told my very first of many lies in wrestling. And I said, yeah. And I was saying to myself, Please, Lord, don't let him ask me, you know, what that experience was, because I had none. Mm -hmm. He said, well, kid, come back next week, wear a tie, and uh, it's a big Fourth of July weekend show, and you can get in the ring. And I thought to myself, eh, that's a bunch of bullshit. There's no way he's going to let me get in the ring. I'm nobody. So the next week when I went, I didn't come dressed in, in, the, in the tie. I had it over my arm. And I didn't own a tuxedo. It was just a makeshift long tie and stuff. And because uh, I thought, well, he's just using me as a backup in case his real announcer doesn't show up. But, damn, I, I got there, and he said, why aren't you dressed? You know, go get dressed. So that started. Who were some of the people, do you remember, that you announced on that first show? Sure. The, main, the very first match was Pretty Boy Larry Sharp against Tony Altimore. And it was Pretty Boy Larry Sharp who owns the Monster Factory and runs the Monster Factory Pro Wrestling School in New Jersey. It was his first match. So Larry Sharp's career and my career started at the same second. And the main event was for the WWWF World Heavyweight Championship. It was um, Nikolai Volkov challenging Bruno San Martino. Um, so, you know, I was like knocking knees in there. I was really nervous, didn't know what I was doing, stumbled around. 
and the people, you know, they can see right through it. Wrestling fans are the smartest people in the world. They can see right. They can see this. This kid didn't belong in the ring. As a fan, who were some of your favorites at that time? Well, Bruno was my hero. When when I would watch the show and, and they do the market specific interviews, and Bruno San Martino would look right at that camera, and this hulking 265 pound guy says to me, "Come, I, I need your support. If I'm going to keep my title, I need your help." I believed him. I thought if I was <laughs> I was at the Elizabeth Armory, if I was in Newark, if I was at Asbury Park, all of the arenas around where I lived, if I was there, he'd have a better chance of winning. And uh, so Bruno was my hero. He was number one. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, then there were a lot, everyone else was secondary to Bruno. Mm -hmm. But there were a lot of guys that, you know, I enjoyed watching. There was Hans and Max Mortier. There were the Graham brothers, uh, managed by uh, Bobby Davis. Gorilla Monsoon, uh, the Manchurian giant, was, uh, was, a, was a huge star at the time. The Kentuckians, one of which was is Jake the Snake's father. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just the, the list would go on and on. You know, the uh, Strongbow, and, um, the fabulous Moolah has always been around. I mean, you can get someone in here and interview them, and they, they can be 63 years old, and Moolah would be their childhood lady wrestling memory. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there, there were a lot of interesting guys. You know, it was black and white TV. You know, this, we're talking about the 60s. So, it was a different product. And, and what was your schedule like? Because people take it for granted when they'll see you on TV now, or they see at the at the shows that you know you have a real life, and this is this is kind of your getaway, just like it is for the fans. Well, for the first 15 years that I announced, I also taught school. Um, for the first, there were my 11 years with the WWF, because we only um, we only taped the TV show once every three weeks. We did three weeks of wrestling at the Philadelphia Arena and then later on in Allentown, Pennsylvania, uh, in one night. Mm -hmm. So I would just bring whatever I needed to wear that night to school with me. Mm -hmm. And I'd teach Spanish all day, hop in the car, and make my way to whatever arena I was told uh, I was working. And who lined you up with the, uh, the, the first TV spots that you do with the McMahon family? Uh, my guardian angel was Gorilla Monsoon. Um, when I started announcing, I didn't know that he was the boss. And... Uh, but he was a part owner of the WWF with Vince McMahon Sr. He owned, I think, 25%. And um, at the end of the summer, that Wildwood summer that I talked about previously, he gave me a call and he said, uh, Gary, he said, would you like to continue with me? And uh, I said to him, sure. So every month he would tell me where I was going to be. And uh, he, was, he was a really smart guy. Though I did, the two years after the first day that I stepped into the ring, I come to find out that he's in charge of all television production. And he knew that if I was his local announcer, and his local announcer was on television, that it would elevate the importance of all of his shows. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had the inside track of being the uh, TV announcer to replace Buddy Wagner, who was the, mm -hmm. the announcer at the time. And Vinny was like about 29 years old, and he was the commentator. Uh, I was in the in-the-ring announcer. You, you, uh, you mentioned the book that you had to uh, compete for the for the spot as the TV announcer with a, a candidate from the New Jersey Athletic Commission with the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Athletic Commission. Sorry, but it was bogus. I mean, they knew I had the, the 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 deck was stacked. They knew that they wanted me as the announcer, and it was even illegal for me to announce in Pennsylvania at the time because their rules said you had to be a a, a uh, resident mm -hmm. of the state. But I don't know how they worked it out. But um, I know when I was at when I was at the Spectrum, they used to have. Um, another announcer come in and he would announce two matches, the first two matches or maybe the second or the third match if they wanted me to open the show mm -hmm. and they would pay him for the full night's work and he would leave. Mm -hmm. So they would always pay a Pennsylvania resident but I was really the announcer. Mm -hmm. I don't know how Finn Senior and, and Monsoon worked that out. Well, you talked uh, uh, several stories about uh, the indiscretions of the commissions and, uh, and how you had to play up to them if, if you were going to be a successful promoter. Without telling all the stories in the book, Just can you just share one with us? Um, well, sure. I mean, they, the, the most obvious one to the fans at home is when they lifted the curfew. And that was just, you know, a bunch of baloney. Uh, yeah, they probably did have in the statute somewhere that the event could not um, last le later than 8, 11 o'clock p.m. But they customarily would just, you know, lift the curfew. It was, um, or if one of the, um, well, the guys had to get checked by doctors. And um, I don't know how many, 
going back, Haystacks Calhoun was, was a, a pretty big figure in many ways. <laughs> but he was, he was uh, 600 pounds, and I don't know how many nights he actually passed the doctor's tests. But it didn't matter because um, whoever, because of the relationship that the McMahon family, Finn Sr. in particular at this time, mm -hmm. and the commissions had, whatever agreement they had, no one was ever denied a spot on the card. Sure. So um, I was never there to see how they influenced each other. But I, you know, I mean, just the common sense would tell you that um, they were guys who were not qualified physically mm -hmm. to wrestle but always wrestle. Can you give us a background, because uh, at this time this is before uh, McMahon has controlled and ruled wrestling, but there was a lot of territories still under and working with the McMahons. Can you talk about who the promoters were in some of the different towns? Yeah, I mean, there, there were at, at the height of, in fact, when I, uh, when I was in, in the uh, process of putting together my book, Body Slams, um, I got in touch with Harley Race. And I said, Harley, I said, would you do me a favor? I'm going to send you a map of the United States. And would you carve the map out at the height of, of territorial wrestling and, and just label it for me? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think there were like 27 different offices in the United States. Um, and, uh, but the, the most well-known were Crockett's in the Carolinas and uh, the Ganyas up in Minneapolis. Uh, the Von Erichs in Dallas, McMahon's in New York. Um, then you had some your West Coast promoters um, who I wasn't as familiar with. Um, but there were but really 27. I mean, Bill Watts was in Oklahoma eventually. Um, but then again, it depends on what year you're talking about because they, those territories changed forms and, and changed um, owners. Um, you had your, your Georgia office, your Eddie Graham down in Florida. And Gunkel was in uh, Georgia. It depended on, on the time frame. Mm -hmm. the, the TV tapings, you did three TV tapings uh, in one night. Can, yep. you, can you describe uh, the, the length and all the process that goes into such a long TV taping? Yeah, well, first off, the reason that they, that, that they did it that way was for pure economical reasons. Um, they, they would get three weeks' worth of television in one night, and that would mean renting the building once, uh, renting the TV production, because WWF didn't own TV cameras, renting the, the TV production facility uh, once instead of three times, paying everybody once, uh, the wrestlers, and, and, and TV was where you were paid the least amount of money, mm -hmm. with the theory that if you're on TV, it's going to make you more over in the arenas where you'll be compensated. Mm -hmm. So the wrestlers were paid very, very little. Um, for TV with, with that idea. Um, so we would do three hours worth and there'd be a short intermission between each hour. Um, there were nights when in the first hour a wrestler would be carried out after being bloodied and pummeled. And then two hours later that same night he'd be back all refreshed and you know run into the ring and and the people in the audience in Philadelphia they just accepted it. They, they wanted to believe. The people at home, uh, to the people at home it was separated by two, two weeks. So that made sense. There were times when uh, a match didn't go as planned. So a little bit later, they would just redo the same match, you know, with the correct ending or the correct spin to it. Mm -hmm. um, but people were very accepting, you know, back then. They wanted it. They wanted to believe. So it was a very different um, environment. Um, the Philadelphia Arena was a uh, no air conditioning, wooden building, smelled of urine and and uh, hot dog grease. <laughs> And um, so, you know, in the summer, everybody cooked. But it, it was an atmosphere that, um, that really added to the event. Low rent, but added to the event. Sure. Um, it was a building where they had uh, roller, roller derby and boxing. And they even had, but they also had the mayor's ball there, which I always thought <laughs> that was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, it just, because it was, it was really a stinky, stinky building, mm -hmm. you know. But um, it was great for wrestling. You uh, held no punches when you uh, described the McMahon's managerial style and how they treated their uh, uh, independent contractors. We can't call them employees, apparently. But uh, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, but when you say I held no punches, all I did was tell the truth. I know a lot of people don't do that. <laughs> gee, I wonder why. Um, but nevertheless, I, 
they they control they they needed to control their performers. If the, if you could not be controlled, then you weren't going to be working for them. And it was a very it was a passive form of control. In the eleven years that I worked with the McMahon family, nobody ever came up to me and patted me on the back and said, "Good job." And I was a kid. I was I was uh, a geek. I was a total mark in the beginning, and um, they had me by my heartstrings. I would have done anything to remain part of the organization. But he didn't understand that. He didn't understand that I could be loyal because I loved what I was doing and I loved the spectacle of wrestling. Um, I was teaching, as I said before, during all of my years with the big mans, and that's where most of my money, my income came from. It was not a lot of money, but that was the bulk of my income. And he knew that, and the all, you know, he's never told me that, you know, Gara, I didn't like you because I could control you, but I just had to surmise because he's never going to tell me the truth. Mm -hmm. um, so I just think that because he couldn't control my purse strings, because he couldn't control my, my living, that he couldn't conceive of the fact that I could be loyal to him. That if he couldn't buy your loyalty, then it didn't exist. And that's just my opinion. Um, in the 11 years that I worked with him, I mean, he, he very rarely talked to me. It was maybe three times. And two times was to fire me, you know, fired me from TV and fired me from the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, but that was that, facet, that, that, that passive form of control. And when I started to get on the inside of this mafia-like brotherhood, um, I come to find out that there, most of the wrestlers were treated the same way. It wasn't just because I was um, the lowest guy in the totem pole of the promotion, you know, being the ring announcer. And um, he would wear these, his bedroom slippers. He would wear these terry cloth bedroom slippers, his flip-flop slippers at the uh, TV tapings. You know, he would announce in them and, you know, of course the, the camera would never capture them. But there was this, this little, like, symbol of this is my home turf. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the boss's son. You know, I'm, 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 I'm daddy's number one guy. And uh, so after a while, I just stopped trying to please him. I just ignored him. And, um, and, and, but there did come a time when I realized that I must be of some value to them because they kept on asking me to come back. They kept me on television. But it took a, an illness, an extended illness that I had, which, which sidelined me for a few months before I realized um, that they didn't put anyone in my place, that they held my job open. So I must have been doing something right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was always, kept me very insecure. With the illness, you, were, you said you were sidelined for about six months, is that right? I was, it was from, well, it was November through January of that year. Mm -hmm. And you also point out that there was only one person that called you the entire time that would have represented the WWF. Not soon, yeah. A gorilla was the first person to treat me as a human being, cared about me as an individual, he and his wife Maureen. Um, the Grand Wizard of Wrestling was, was really cool early on, also. Um, yeah, I mean, he, uh, Gino was very well respected by everybody. Legitimate athlete, three, three letter man at Ithaca College, uh, track, football, wrestling. Um, really keen business sense, and a fair minded guy. Mm -hmm. um, so when, when he was ultimately booted out of his partnership agreement, um, it was a really sad thing. He, he thought that he had for life that he was going to be a partner uh, with McMahon. And uh, there was uh, some technicality where when Vinny decided to go national that he, uh, he bought Monsoon's shares and I'm sure he paid, paid him fair market value for them. But they couldn't equal what that stock would be worth over the lifetime sure. of Monsoon. You, uh, you had told an interesting story the first time you met Shane McMahon. Yeah, you just gave the ending of the story away, but I'll tell the story. Um, I was, uh, my, Vinny very rarely came to live shows. He would be at Madison Square Garden, and he would be at TV tapings. So whenever he showed up at a, at a, a live, non-televised event, the locker room would get very solemn. Everybody would think, oh, whose head's going to roll tonight? There must have been a reason to bring the boss and the boss's son out. This was the Meadowlands Arena, Continental Airlines Arena today. And um, he was actually there that night to see that the main event went the right way. It was um, a Hulk Hogan main event. It was just at the start of where he was going to go national. 
and um, I was at ringside. New Jersey was a commission state at the time. There were athletic commissioners sitting to my left. There was this kid, 13-year-old kid, didn't know who he was, sitting to my right. And I just assumed that he was with the commissioners. And the politically correct thing to do would be, you don't mess with the commissioners. I tried to talk to them as little as I could. And um, I just tried to uh, put up with this kid, who kept on asking me these very pointed business questions the entire night. And of course, I'm protecting the business, and I'm not going to answer these questions directly. Um, and then also, the, er the earlier matches were spilling outside the ring. And once in a while, the table would go over, the microphone would, would and this kid was kept on getting in the way. And he was annoying. And I was annoying him because I wasn't answering his questions directly. Until finally, he got so frustrated that he said to me, you know, I bet you don't know who I am. And I said, you're right, I don't have a clue as to who you are. He said, I'm Shane. I'm Vince's son. So, uh, I thought, now I, this may not have been the, the nicest thing to do, but what I did was I said, I've got the boss's son here, and he has a lot of talking he wants to do. So let me just ask him a question or two to kind of just, yeah, see what kind of response I can get. And I thought, well, let me, let me toss him a real softball question. I said to him, you know, over the years, your grandfather's been a great promoter, Madison Square Garden sellouts every month. Your dad is now taking the organization across the country. You've heard a lot of talk about wrestling promoters and the, and the headaches that promoters have around the dinner table, Thanksgiving, you know, you, you, it's your family's life. If there was the most important thing that a promoter should know, what should it be? And this kid, without skipping a beat, spun around to me and he said, the most important thing that a wrestling promoter should know is don't make your talent know how important they are to you so you can get away with paying them the least amount of money. And I said, holy shit. Like, he, I, he, he shut me up. <laughs> that was the last question I asked him. I didn't expect, you know, now where do you get that from? You know, it goes back to the control, the control issue. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but that was my, when I wrote that in Body Slams, I had no idea that would have an impact as it did. Mm -hmm. Because the first drafts of Body Slams were written before Shane became a TV personality. Right. And then, of course, right before the book was put out, I updated everything. And I went through it and brought it up to snuff. But... Um, yeah, I mean that's 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 like one of the one of the main uh, parts of Body Slams, the book that people comment on was this little Shane and what he had to say. Mm -hmm. I understand he's a nice guy. I mean, I'm not, I don't know him as an adult. Sure. You, you told the story of uh, asking for your first raise from the company. Oh yeah, TV. Well, I was making in the beginning. I was making fifteen, twenty-five dollars at the for the house shows, and I worked high schools and colleges. Um, I worked um, army bases, nightclubs, convention halls, wherever they told me to go. And, um, but for TVs, I was making $65 a night. Now, that was for three hours of television. So it's like uh, $22.60 a, a, a week mm -hmm. of television. And I went, into Vince, I went up to Vinnie Jr. and I, I said, I'd like to talk to you, you know, about getting a raise. And he just said to me, well, that's, that's not my job. Go, go talk to my father. So they had this little cubicle of an office, the box office, at the Hamburg Fieldhouse in Hamburg, Pennsylvania. And that's where um, Vin, Vince Sr. and Monsoon and Arnold Skolin, and that's where they hung out. So I knocked on the door, and they let me in, and I went in, and I, I said to him, you know, I've been announcing you know, for five years now. I've been getting $65 a night for these TVs. Uh, I think I would you know, deserve a little bit more money. And uh, he said, well, what do you think you should get? And I said, maybe a hundred dollars, you know, for the... He said, where do you think I'm going to get the money from? I can't afford that. We're talking about a millionaire. We're talking about a guy who, you know, sells out Madison Square Garden every month, the Boston Gardens, Pittsburgh Civic Arena, down in D.C., the Philadelphia Arena, and then the Spectrum. And I, what was I going to say? I was a kid. I was just, I said, oh, okay, I, I, just, I, just, I just thought I, I, I deserve it. And, da, 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 da. and he just, you know, just like, like blew me off. The, the, the ironic thing about it was that then he went to tell his local promoter to start paying me the hundred dollars. And I, I often thought, why couldn't he just say, yeah, you deserve it, and pay me, and say, I'll tell him. He couldn't do that. I mean, that, that little good job Gary stroke was not part of their way of operating. Well, I guess Shane's, Shane's answer pretty much answered that question for you. Right, huh? <laughs> this is true. But Shane's answer didn't come until later, right. you know, later years.
this was, I'm talking about, you know, 76, 77, 78, and Shane was, or that's Shane's stories from the early 80s. Mm -hmm. Or yeah. actually mid-80s, right, because of Hogan. Well, what was it like being a TV personality? Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't even know why I was a TV personality. You're, you're looking at a guy who got up, and my claim to fame, my claim to fame was announcing names, weights, and places. <laughs> I mean, I always used to think to myself, how tough is that? I mean, um, how much of a, how much could a person sitting at home, not only know about me or think they know about me, but even give a damn about me? Mm -hmm. But they did. They did, and I think they did because of that early um, shuffling around that I did and the tripping that I did. And on a, on a night when, when it was a, like a boring card, people used to rely on me for entertainment. They used to, there was one night, early on, um, I was this earnest, you know, guy, geek. And, and, and I was announcing in, in Wildwood, once again, and all of a sudden, in the middle of a, of a, of a high-pitched introduction, I lost the sight of my left eye. And, and it didn't matter. I just kept going. I didn't know why. I didn't know why. They, I just kept on announcing. And and then the people, all, I could hear the people, and they were just like cheering and 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 little jeering, but they were roaring. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I didn't think this announcement was that good. It comes to I come to find out there was this guy from Philadelphia that was sitting in the in the ringside seat, and he just got tired of hearing me talk, or got tired because he was bored or whatever, and he took a hot dog and he flung it, and it slapped me in the forehead, and it lodged between my eyebrow and my eyeglasses. And it's so I, I that therefore I couldn't see there was mustard, and I kept on announcing. And for the first part of that announcement, I had a hot dog flapping in my head, and that's and they were roared, roaring, you know, and they liked me, you know. And I, I never tried to 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 give them this Ken doll kind of image. It was like, oh, I'm Gary, Michael, I'm, I'm, I'm Gary, you know. And and the announcer, um, is the one person in the promotion that the public has the uh, most access to. So if the people were pissed about something, it was me they'd come to. And, 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 and let me know what they thought about the fact that so-and-so cheated and got away with the title or whatever. And um, so I, I always realized that when I was announcing that my job didn't start when I got in the ring, it started when I left the car. And, and, and I was a representative, was like public relations representative for the organization. Mm -hmm. um, TV, being on TV, getting back, so people did, re people did identify with me. And then George Steele had attacked me on television early on and that people had never seen an announcer get involved with the action before. I mean, that was, so it brought a lot of attention to me. Mm -hmm. The women, the women were really uh, sympathetic towards me because this big brute, you know, just pounced on me. Sure. And, the, and, the, and the rough, tough guys at ringside said, ah, you should have kicked him in the ball. Someone would get away with that. Because every time that, that George still came to the ring, I ran. I, I ran away from him. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, I was afraid of the guy. Now, there's something that's not in body slams. That's, that I just learned last year from George, from George Steele. Um, we were at a promotional event for the book. I had invited a lot of people who I write about to be there. I more or less brought the book to life. Mm -hmm. And uh, George says to me, he says, you know, he said, that when I attacked you on television, that was one of the best things that ever happened to you. I said, George, you're right. He said, and for me too. He said, you know, because it made you more sympathetic and it made me look, you know, look more of an animal and out of control kind of guy. He said, but here's, here's something that you don't know. He said, the reason I attacked you is because you insulted me. Now, we're going to talk about old school here. About, this is something that today's people could not identify with. I said to him, George, how the hell could I have insulted you? I was afraid of you. Mm -hmm. He said, well, he said, let me, let me bring you back to the Philadelphia arena. He said, you came up to me and you said to me, where should I tell the people you're from, and what should I tell the people you weigh? And remember, I barked at you, and you ran away. I said, that's right. I remember that. I said, and I thought to myself, how the hell am I ever going to make this introduction? And he said, you came back later in the night, and you asked the same question, where should I tell the people you're from? And I barked at you again. He said, but you insulted me because by asking that question, you were telling me that I was a fake. You didn't say to me, now listen to how old school this is, you didn't say to me, where are you from? You said, where should I tell the people you're from? And that offended me. Something else you don't know, he continued. He said, the second time you came up and, and asked about, you know, where I was from, standing behind you was Vince McMahon Sr., and he was listening on, in on all this. And he came over to me afterwards, and he said to me, leave the kid alone. You know, he's new on television, 
And I said to him, no, 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 Vince, I'm going to teach that kid a lesson. He said, then I came out, and then, of course, I attacked you. He said, and I started chewing on your carnation boutonniere. And something else you don't know, he said, is that when I, when I started chewing on your carnation boutonniere, the tongue from the flower went through my tongue, he said. And then he just stopped, and he said, but, you know, I deserve that. <laughs> so, I mean, that's so old school. You sure, know? Yeah. I, we never, you know, people today couldn't identify with it. I'm not answering your original question about being on television, but I, we just keep on getting into these other things. Um, the WWF TV product was uh, in the New York area was only seen Saturday nights, midnight on Channel 9, before WOR was a super station. And the power of that show was incredible. Two, three weeks on the air for my maybe 40, 50 seconds total of being seen on the air, and people would come up to me, and, and they would recognize me. And they were wondering why I was, you know, at the convenience store, why I was at the department store. And I'd say, well, where do you think I'm supposed to be? You know, it's like, we all have lives. And they, of course, they thought I was, you know, making tons of money. Mm -hmm. when we've already established I was making $65 for three, <laughs> three weeks of TV. Uh, but the, the, the show was a very powerful show, even seen midnight Saturdays once a week. And that was the only exposure they had to me. Um, so people, uh, I, it got to the point, I mean, I would be walking down uh, Broadway, New York, would stop me. And it got to the point where, um, and then other things that happened that, that got me uncomfortable with uh, people that, didn't, that I don't know coming up and talking to me. But yet, just, and it amazed me that they had this concept of who I was and what I was all about. And when you think about what I actually did on the air, weights, places, names, is all I said. Mm -hmm. That they actually thought that they knew me. And they, they, they attached their own identity to me. The uh, the one story when I was reading the book that I was like, I'd really like him just, even if he has to read it from the book, just to, just to see the expression on your face and your voice is uh, the story of Esther. Esther. I'll tell you the story. Um, after uh, I got a lot of exposure on television, um, I was at a uh, local non-televised event. At the end of the event, I was making my way down the aisle, and... Um, this, this story makes me uncomfortable, but I'll tell you the story. Um, I, and I was, I was stopped in the aisle by a, by a woman who didn't say anything, just kind of looked at me. And I kind of looked back at her and said, hi, how you doing? And, and I, I tried to side, sidestep her to, to make my way down, and she stood in front of me. She stopped, sidestepped too. And, and so I said, can I do something for you? And is there something you want? She said, um, no, she said, I, I just want you to know that I, I want to start a fan club. Now, at the time, there were fan clubs for wrestlers, were, it was a very common thing. So I said to her, well, that's great. I said, who do you want to start a fan club for? I just carried on some kind of conversation with her just to try to get by to get, get home that night. She said, for you. I said, for me. I said, who would want to join a fan club for me? She said, well, I've been talking to a lot of people at ringside. She said, no, I think there's interest. I said, no, nah, I'm really not comfortable with that. I said, um, but thank you very much. And I made my way back. And she would pop up every so often. And she would ask me the same question. And I kept on avoiding the issue. Um, one of the reasons was I, I didn't want to feel all that embarrassed. Like if, if someone started a fan club for me and no one joined. <laughs> it was just very simple. Um, and, uh, but finally, she started talking to me. And she started, like, not that I would see her anywhere else but in the aisles on my way out trying to get out of the arena. But, she, you know, and then she said to me, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? You know, if, if it doesn't work out, we'll just stop it. So I, I finally agreed. So Esther, who told me that she was a licensed nurse, but was out of work because of an illness, always had her legs bandaged with ACE bandages. And I never questioned it. I figured she's a nurse. She told me she has an illness, and I'll, it's not my business. Mm -hmm. um, she started to put together... Uh, um, solicitations for uh, fans to join, and and she was doing really well. I mean, we had hundreds of people that actually joined by the time it was all over. Um, she put out a newsletter that was always rated the top newsletter. We would get these awards from the wrestling fans convention. Um, she she spent 24/7 on this fan club. She uh, 
she'd go to uh, Kinko's or the copy company at the time and 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 get you know everything just laid out perfectly. Go out do interviews, um, and and then um, I started to hear that there were fans that were members of the club that started getting these odd telephone calls. And they were all women that were getting these very little obscene and odd calls. And I, you know, I didn't. I was a little concerned, but I didn't really relate it to anything in particular. Finally. I started hearing people coming up to me, congratulating me on my engagement to Esther. I said, excuse me? They, well, you know, Esther told us that you're engaged and you're going to be getting married. And I thought, well, this, this is weird. I mean, that's not true, you know? So I started to do a little investigating. And, and it, so it turns out that any of the women who would be friendly with me, she would target them. She started to write them poison pen letters. She started to call them anonymously and make threats. Um, I didn't know any of this was going on. And, and when, I, when I learned that it was going on, I approached her. And I said, this has got to stop. You know, I, I really, we're going to stop this, this club. Or you're not going to be president anymore. She just stared at me. She just like gazed. I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, and now, in the in, this was a, these were a much more innocent days. These were this was like in the late seventies, I'd say. And I actually went to her house to tell her this, and she was home alone. And I went inside to take the fan club stuff away from her because that's how adamant I was that these people were not going to get harassed anymore. And you, I would never do that today. Right. I mean, could have been seen too many movies. Huh? Well, that was the other thing. That was. At, at, it's funny that you say that because at the time. There was a Clint Eastwood movie out that I went to see called Play Misty for Me. And it was about a, a radio DJ, Clint Eastwood, who was being stalked by a female listener. And, and, and that, it was a thriller. And it, that really freaked me out when I saw that. And this was happening at the same time. So, um, so anyway, I, I got out of the house with whatever I needed. And um, every event after that, she showed up dressed in black, with black wraparound sunglasses on. She would sit in the front row, but instead of watching the matches, she stared at me all the time. Freaked me out. The only time she looked at the ring was when I was in there. And she had this, one, some night she would wear this black veil, and she was in mourning. And one night, after an Asbury Park wrestling card, which was the, the arena that was closest to where I lived, um, I went out with some friends to a diner, and after that, we went to, um, I, I went home. And as I'm driving down the street in front of my parents' house, I was living at home at the time, I saw a fire in front of the house, like a bonfire. And I pulled up to the curb and I got out and I started to just like stamp it out. And I look at what I'm stamping and there are pictures of me, old um, newsletters from the fan club, anything fan club related. She had just taken all of them and, and set them on fire, and uh, it really freaked me out, really. And then she disappeared, and then as a t I come to find out that the reason from her family, she died, shortly, she died very young, she died shortly after, she was a very ill woman, that the reason that she was, she was bandaging her legs was because she used to take pencils, and she used to stab her legs with pencils, so she was getting lead poisoning. Now, I didn't know any of this until after she passed away, and one of her cousins who used to be a wrestling fan, came and, and, and told me this stuff. When she died, they went into her room, and they found in the corner of her room um, a memorial to Gary Michael Capetta, this ring announcer. And then they found on her wall, she was practicing my signature and signatures of others for um, uh, forging, you know, checks and stuff. So um, it's, I'm really uncomfortable with the yeah. topic, but it's... It, 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 I'm, I'm, one thing that I'm happy about is that it didn't, um, and, th and this may just be stupidity on my part, but it, it didn't make me shy away from getting to know fans. Mm -hmm. it, you know, from the very, very beginning, I was freaked, but I'm, I'm more trusting than that. The reason that I even wanted you to talk about it is because I remember reading these magazines and seeing all these places to sign for fan clubs, and then all of a sudden, in no time at all, I remembered it dried up. And you didn't see that anymore, and I didn't know how much of, of this story. Uh, contributed to that, or if, if this story was told to some of the wrestlers that had fan clubs themselves. 
Well, no, nobody could do the job that she did because she spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week doing this. Um, and why the decline? I, I don't know. I really don't, I don't have any idea why they're not as prevalent as they are, as they were at one time. Mm -hmm. Well, we used to, you know, we used to, I think there was more idolization back then of, uh, because it was all considered to be an athletic event. And so you had your hero worship, not of just characters, because the characters weren't as uh, flamboyant as they are today, but as legit athletes as to how we looked at them, you know, how the fans looked at them. Mm -hmm. Why do you think uh, you were never really fired from the WWF? It was, it was fired in stages or, or, or specific cities. Well, why do you think you were released from that, that first city? I think, if I can remember correctly, it was in uh, Philadelphia? Philadelphia, yeah. Um, First of all, I think that one of the reasons that Vinny didn't get rid of me sooner was because Gorilla Monsoon protected me. Mm -hmm. But when he had his shares pulled away from him and his power taken away from him, it left me without someone to help. So, you know, someone who was a decision maker um, that could save my backside. Um, I think, see, any time that a wrestler attacked me, it would not just happen with Steele. A few years later, it happened with uh, Jimmy Superfly Snuka. Um, Vinny didn't like that at all. He, he would never make mention of the ring announcer's name or just try to get past it and let's get on to the next match. And it's not that I ever drew attention to myself. If I had drawn attention to myself on purpose, I could understand he'd have a legitimate reason to be pissed because Gary Michael Capetta never sold a ticket. No one ever came to a wrestling match because I was the announcer and no one ever tuned into a TV show because I was there. And I understand that. I was always a second banana, and I just tried to be the best second banana that I could be. So for there to be undue attention brought to somebody that doesn't sell tickets would be a waste of their money and their airtime. Um, but it was, they were the wrestlers who were putting themselves over by using me as a prop, which is all I was. Um, so why he would be so pissed at me, I don't know. But you can tell. He would give me these dirty looks after I was attacked. I was like, well, what the hell do you want me to do? And then tell you, get your guys in the... Tell them what you want from them, or you know what not to do. Um, so I don't know. There was one time when he should have fired me, that he didn't, and I couldn't believe that he didn't. And that was after he had gone national, and it was one of my like my last year working with them. Um, Vern Gagne and Jim Crockett got together and formed Pro Wrestling USA, and um, they started to bring their talent to the Northeast. They asked me to announce for them. And I did. And I, and I announced for them at the Meadowlands Arena when I was still announcing for the WWF. And it very well may be that I'm the only person who's ever worked for Jim Crockett's NWA, Vern Gagne's AWA, and Vince McMahon's WWF all at the same time. Mm -hmm. First week I'd be in the, in the Meadowlands saying Pro Wrestling USA is the greatest uh, product ever. And then two weeks later I'd be um, in the WWF saying the same thing. And I, he should have fired me then, but he never did. I mean, he knew that I was announcing. He used to send Pat Patterson and Howard Finkel, and they were the stooges. Mm -hmm. they, would get, they would get dressed in, like, uh, disguise and sit up in the cheap seats and, you know, report back. I mean, and I know that's true. Pat used to come down to ringside to say hi to me. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I don't know why he didn't fire me, but I decided. I knew that I wasn't going on with the McMahons. And um, I just decided that if there was one thing that I could bring forward that would be valuable to other promoters would be my credibility and, and the contact that I had made with the fans, the rapport that I had with them. So by announcing for both groups and saying they were both the greatest organizations in the world really shot my credibility to hell. Mm -hmm. And if I had, I only did it for two months. And uh, so I just stopped showing up at WWF events. They never called to see where I was and it was just that kind of a split. And you gave uh, you gave Vince very little credit uh, for going national or, or taking over the territories. I think you put the uh, I think you probably said it was more the the promoters not adapting to the changes that that Vince was able to make. It was almost inevitable. Um, I I'll agree with you and disagree with you at the same time. Uh, I don't think I ever take took anything away from his vision, his vision of going national and his vision of marketing and developing a whole new spin on an existing 
sports entertainment or wrestling, pro wrestling at the time. But I also did say <clears throat> that there were guys like Vern Gagne who laughed at him when he, when he was going national. They thought this kid, Vinny McMahon, was going to fall on his face. And uh, they totally underestimated his ability. Um, what I think you're referring to was that a guy like Vern Gagne, uh, one of my favorite quotes from the book is that Vern Gagne shows that he reveres the past by continuing to live in it because he never caught up with the times. He never had to because he was the only product that the people in the AWA territory could see. But that was the same with all of the territories. Uh, those who lived in the New York area, the Boston area, the Pittsburgh area could only see the WWF also. Mm -hmm. But one thing that Vince could do that these old timers couldn't do and that he was actually prepared to do and they didn't realize that they would have to do is counter program. I mean, here's a guy who never had competition. Vern Gagne or Jim Crockett, Fritz von Erich, all of them. Vince McMahon, senior. They never had competition, with minor exception. I mean, there, there were minor groups that would come in once in a while and dare to challenge uh, uh, Vince Sr. There was one group that the mighty Igor was in, uh, led the, uh, the group as, as far as our wrestlers go. But that was really negligible. Um, but, he, but Vinny bowled over a bunch of guys who were rich and fat from years of being the only guy in town, of, of not having competition. And uh, they never were used to competing. And, and I think that's what you're referring to when you, when you say, I don't, I don't give him credit. I think that helped. I think that if um, Michael Eisner was an owner of a wrestling territory, that I think Vinny would have had a tougher time in overtaking Michael Eisner's territory. But you're dealing with Jim Crockett and Vern Gagne and Fritz von Erich, you know, who, who, who didn't have the vision, didn't have, they just weren't prepared, mm -hmm. and, and didn't have the experience in um, combating anyone. Yeah, you named all those guys by name in the book. Have you seen any or heard back from them about, I'm sure that some of these guys have read the book, or at least they've heard about your comments. Have you gotten any backlash? I guess particularly from Vern. From Vern. Or Crockett or more so from Vern, I think you kind of outdated him more than the others. Um, no, I haven't. No? I haven't talked to him. He hasn't called. I'll t you know who one of the first ones to buy the book was? <laughs> a guy by the name of Ed Cohen, who's been the arena manager, arena booker for the WWF since the beginning of Hulkamania. Mm -hmm. And uh, he paid for it and had it shipped to Titan Towers. Wow, well, so someone's in there reading it. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard from them now. Uh, you told an interesting story about Pasadena, Texas. Oh yeah, there was during my my uh, independent years. It was the only time in 21 years that I've ever been stiffed for a paycheck. And um, there was a guy who uh, was a promoter, and he wanted to do an all girls wrestling video. I knew what it was for. We agreed on a price, and it was supposed to be actually in Houston, Texas. He was going to go to the Sam Houston Coliseum and team up with the, the main promoter there. And uh, I didn't know the guy was not the most reputable of guys. I just knew he was going to pay me, and I had my air ticket back and forth. So that's that was my little security. Mm -hmm. When I got there, it turns out that, nah, after all, we were not going to the Sam Houston Coliseum because he had a falling out or a disagreement with the promoter there. And so he quickly had to find another arena. And Pasadena is a suburb of Houston. And uh, so he put us all on buses. But before he did that, he said that he didn't have the money to pay for the buses. So he passed a hat around. And, and I, I, was, I wasn't going to put a, a penny in there. You know, I was just, but yet a lot of people did. And uh, so they, were, they drove us out on the bus to this arena. And um, um, I got... I had a lot of work to do in the background because I didn't know any of these lady wrestlers. So I had to get all the information from them, and I didn't pay too much attention to what was going on in the arena. And uh, when I went out for the first match, my, my focus was on the camera, addressing the camera, and, and starting the show. And, and then I went and sat down, and as I'm sitting there, I'm looking around the arena, and I'm thinking, there are an awful lot of women here. In fact, I don't see men, like maybe a few. And that just wasn't our typical audience. 
And um, what turned out to be was that one of the ways that he recruited a quick audience for this all ladies video shoot was to go to the lesbian organizations in the in the area, and um, and and they were hooting and hollering, and uh, Luna was was their you know the biggest favorite, you know, with her head half shaved, and she had chains and leather, and and um, and and what was funny was that your petite southern um, feminine stars were booed, <laughs> and Luna was she was the favorite, um, as it turned out. Uh, I never got paid, and I could see a lot of people weren't getting paid, and I was didn't want to get stuck with my hotel bill, so I left that Howard Johnson's um, real early in the morning, and I just kind of like slept a couple hours at the airport waiting for my flight. Did you ever see this thing released a video? No, I haven't. No, never even heard about it again. Never heard about it again. Okay, we're going to leap ahead for the sake of time and uh, get right into the the days of WCW, which which I know for a lot of people is the first time that. That they're familiar with your face. That's true. How, how did you? Uh, Actually, you know what? They're they're more familiar with my voice than my face. Yes, that's true. That, that, yeah, I get when I when I do uh, bookstore appearances, I read from the book very little bit from the very beginning, where it necessitates the announce voice, mm -hmm. and that stirs memories. Mm -hmm. Knowing them. How did you uh, start to work with WCW or at that time as the NWA? Well, I was doing uh, pay per views for Jim Crockett NWA. And before it was bought by Turner Broadcasting. And I was also appearing and doing the announcing for Vern Gagne's AWA. And a um, message was sent to me after uh, Jim Crockett sold to Turner Broadcasting. A message was sent to me by Jim Hurd, the first executive vice president of WCW, that I should stop announcing for the AWA for the same reason that I stopped voluntarily working for the WWF. And that was he didn't want me to be a representative for any other organization. And um, I sent word. My first reaction was, well, why didn't Jim call me and tell me? But as long as he wants to go through somebody, just tell him that um, there's no way that I'm going to turn down work when he doesn't have work for me. And that if he wants me to be exclusive to him, that he needed to put me on a retainer. He needed to put me on, give me a, a constant paycheck. And that's how, and he did. And that's how I started working full time for WCW in uh, 1989. What would you say were your your favorite days of announcing? Would you call those days some of your favorites? The NWA days, uh, end of the 80s with Jim Crockett, uh, Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, Magnum TA, Ronnie Garvin, uh, Rock and Roll Express, Midnight Express with Jim Cornette, The Barbarian, Paul Jones, um, Barry Windham, um, Tully Blanchard, Arn Anderson, uh, you know, the Four Horsemen, the height of the Four Horsemen days. Um, they, they were the most exciting because I was used to the WWF product, which is a much lighter product. It was a, I wasn't used to this hard-hitting, uh, more violent, actually, brand of wrestling. Uh, it was much more imaginative, too. Um, one of my favorite pay-per-views was a Great American Bash in which they had a, three cages stacked upon the other, but vertically, and it was the Triple Tower of Doom with... The, the major players was Kevin Sullivan versus gorgeous Jimmy Garvin for the love of Precious. And she was in the bottom of the, uh, of the, uh, on the mat with the key that would open the door and, and, and she would, uh, at the end of the match, reveal who she really loved. But, you know, it was very dramatic and it was very cool. And I, I, I really liked that, those, those years the best. Were there any guys that you became particularly close with, uh, whether it be management or uh, any of the wrestlers? Um, just, uh, yes, not the wrestlers, but Gary Jester, who was um, the NWA representative in the Northeast, and then later uh, went uh, and, and was a major player behind the scenes at WCW uh, in different ways at different times. And I, I made it, uh, it was a conscious decision not to get close with the wrestlers. You'll never be a wrestler, you'll never get close to them, you'll never be accepted totally yet. I was, I was respected by them. But I wouldn't go out uh, afterwards socializing. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's a major mistake that a lot of announcers and referees make. I think it's also one of the reasons that I lasted for 21 years, because um, I always represented the real world as well as fronting the world of pro wrestling. 
for the whichever organization I worked for. And um, I would be the guy in the locker room where if a guy had a problem with management, problem at home, he would come over and, and talk to me and confide in me. Uh, he, he would trust me. Mm -hmm. Talk about the, uh, the competition between WWF and WCW at, or NWA at that time. Um, well, Vince cleaned our clock. You know, for the entire time that I was with WCW, which was before Nitro, um, it would seem that he knew what we were doing before we knew what we were doing. Um, there, was, there were always suspicion that there were stooges that worked in WCW that actually were on Vince's payroll. That was never proven, and I don't know that to be the case. But, I mean, the evidence was, was there that that was a possibility. Um, we would go into a town, and Vinny would have been there a week before. Um, he would have the best arenas locked up. We would have to play the, for instance, in Washington, D.C. We weren't allowed into the Cap Center um, for the most part. We'd have to play the D.C. Armory, which was in a grimy part of the city. Um, and that, that happened in city after city after city. Um, what I think made it more frustrating for everybody than anything else was that Turner Broadcasting had all of the resources to not only match what Vince was doing, but to surpass him. They had all of the media contacts, but we were the bastard stepchild of Turner Broadcasting. This was the organization of CNN, and to a lot of the um, executives at Turner Broadcasting, we were uh, we were like not wanted. You know, they they would the, even the executives who were in charge of overseeing the division would undermine our success. And I, I'm not saying they did it intentionally, but they certainly didn't know anything about wrestling. And then there were those that, that sent like people to work in, in our division that no one else wanted. Um, so we were totally outgunned, and, and it was a very frustrating time. Well, what did, uh, I, I know that you said you didn't befriend many of the wrestlers, but what do you think they thought of the dusty uh, booking, the dusty finishes that everybody laughs in hindsight about now? Um, you know, it, it wasn't. Wrestlers, for the most part, have to be really careful about what they say unless they're talking to someone who's experiencing the same thing, has the same opinion, and um, that they feel that they can trust, although you never really know who you can trust. Um, it, nothing was ever spoken out loud about. In other words, Ric Flair never uh, voiced his frustration mm -hmm. with that. Rick is too smart to do that. Rick is a guy that's never burned a bridge. I mean, he left WCW, went, worked for Vince. Um, could, everyone knew that he could make more money back at WCW. He laid down for whoever he needed to lay down for, for McMahon and shook hands and went back to WCW. And, you know, of course, is now back in WWF. And uh, I, I'm sure Vinny respects him because uh, Ric Flair has always conducted himself professionally. Mm -hmm. Who was your favorite uh, person to announce? Is there one particular guy that, that you just enjoyed doing the announcement more than, more than any other? You mean just enjoy saying the announcement? Whether it be the name or a particular match? or um, Well, there were, okay, getting to particular matches, there were two different times at two different ends of my career. In the beginning, it was the Bruno San Martino Superstar Billy Graham rematches when Bruno came back to get the WWF title. Mm -hmm. Three months in a row, we sold out the Philadelphia Spectrum. It was in the Philadelphia Inquirer. It said, hottest ticket in town. Sold out. And um, there was an emotional tie there for me. Years later, when I was working with WCW, um, it, would, it would be the Ric Flair, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat series of matches that, from a different appreciation, um, from an appreciation of the art of the game, which I talk about in the book, um, was the height of of any match that I introduced. How about some of your uh, your counterpoints? How would you rate them? Uh, someone like uh, Michael Buffer. Um, Michael Buffer is a he's he's principally a boxing announcer. Um, the reason that he was uh, brought into WCW had to do with the way Eric Bischoff operated. Eric Bischoff uh, was in love with Hollywood, in my opinion. He, uh, and Hollywood Hogan, as well as, you know, the, the, the movie television industry. And he 
um, always had an intention of working in television and using wrestling, I think, only as a temporary stepping stone mm -hmm. to get there. Um, early on when I was in WCW, I was doing the Spanish edition of the uh, voiceover, commentating the Spanish edition of WCW. He was in the green room. We were both waiting for studio time to do his show. And uh, he showed me this shortly after he got there. It was a few months after he arrived at WCW. And he had this proposal for a game show that he wanted to present to Turner Broadcasting, which was a wrestler versus fan, and he would be the, uh, the host of the show. And they didn't buy it, and he went to Disney to try to sell it, which is how the Disney WCW connection, I believe, began. Um, he, uh, Michael Buffer, getting back, and the reason for that background is that Michael Buffer's attorney is that rep also represents Hulk Hogan. So there was a connection, there's a Hollywood connection there, and that's why he was brought in. Um, as far as his style of announcing, it's just very different from mine. Um, um, I think that there's uh, personality in my introductions and in my uh, way of conducting myself in the ring. And um, there's a distance that I think is between Michael Buffer and the fans, which I suppose is what he wants. Mm -hmm. He's been very successful, so it's worked for him. How painful is it to watch him uh, call the main event and, and, and screw up either the names or the uh, titles that he's... No, it wasn't painful at all. It was fun. <laughs> I love... Yeah, I mean, I, he, look, he was paid $6,000 to come in at that time to do one match. And um, I thought that if someone's going to be paid six grand, then they should know what they're doing. So I would just sit there and watch, and I wouldn't save him. I would just let him... It didn't matter because he was going to be loved by management anyway. Mm -hmm. But just my own little thing was, hey, if, if, you know, if you're going to come in, you're going to get paid six grand, and all you're going to do is one match in the course of the night, maybe you should do a little research and get it right. Mm -hmm. But if he didn't have to, and if it wasn't important to him how he, how he came across, then that was their business. I mean, if management didn't like it so much, they would have told him, they would have given him exactly what they wanted him to say. Mm -hmm. And if it was important to him to look more professional in the wrestling ring, then he would have found out. So I just let it happen. And no, I, it wasn't difficult at all. It was fun. <laughs> how about, uh, how would you rate Howard Finkel's job? Oh, Howard's got the, always has had the best voice in the business. Um, and he's, he's very effective at what he does. Um, once again, I think the difference, one difference between what he does and what I did is um, I, I, I put more of a personality in, into it. People knew, felt like they knew me better. Um, Howard has also allowed himself, both in the ring and behind the scenes, to be a foil in, in the guy's inside jokes. And I, I wouldn't appreciate that if, uh, if that, if, later on in my years, you know, having been established, I wouldn't appreciate being made a fool of. Mm -hmm. And they do that to him, and he's accepted it for a lot of years. I know it's probably out of place, but if I don't ask it now, I'll, I'm sure I'll forget it. You, uh, you had mentioned that Sergeant Slaughter had tried to start up a, a union, and uh, that was quickly squashed, and, uh, and, and now he's working with the WWE again, so I guess he, he mended whatever bridges he had, he had blown up. Well, wh what is your whole opinion of, uh, of a union or, or wrestlers coming together to stand up against the management after seeing this for 20 years? Well, I know it'll never happen. At least I believe it'll never happen. I, I believe it'll never happen for sure in the WWF, but um, wrestlers are considered independent contractors, um, as was I. And what that means is, is that we received no opportunity for workman's compensation. There definitely was no disability insurance. Can you imagine being a wrestler, what the premiums would cost uh, for disability insurance? Um, there's no, there are no stock options, there are no retirement benefits. and um, and that would be okay if we actually performed like independent contractors. But in my opinion, and I think that if you look at the IRS statutes, that somebody who's told where you're going to work, when, what you're going to do when you get there, and not be allowed to work for any other organization, I think that's more of a, comes under the uh, definition of an employee. And I don't know how wrestling has gone away, gotten away with it for years. There was one short period of time in WCW where they made me an employee.
but it would last a few months, and for whatever reason, they stopped. And they gave me an option. Actually, if, if I wanted to, I could have been uh, gotten all of those benefits. I would have had to have given up $10,000 of my income to do so. And because it was the wrestling business, and because I didn't really believe that I was going to be lasting for all that long, and it was six years with WCW, um, I said, no, I'll take the money, not the benefits. But that's not even an option for wrestlers. Other than the time with Slaughter, did you see any wrestler even talk about it seriously, other than just privately among each other? No, no. Um, that would be considered a cancer in the locker room. You never, you, the management would never want that kind of uh, force to be brewing. Mm -hmm. they, no, they wouldn't do it. I mean, they wouldn't say it. The quotes that pre, uh, preceded the chapters in your book, did you, did you pick all those out yourself? I did. I did. Did you pick them out before or after you wrote the chapters? After I wrote the chapters. I would, yeah, because um, I wasn't going to let anything, um, that would have been a minor influence, but I wasn't going to let anything influence what I had to say and what I wrote in the book. Um, there were very often, as I was writing, I felt like there was someone looking over my shoulder, whether it be uh, a, uh, a, someone who bought the book at the store or someone I was writing about. And it was really tough to um, to ignore that thought of, what well, I wonder what they would think about, or wonder what they will say when they see what I've written. And uh, I just thought to be true to, to what I'm all about, and to be true to what I, the people expect from me, was just to write things straight shoot, exactly as I see it. Um, people can agree or disagree, but you know there's not been one thing that's been disputed or refuted that's in that book. My next question was going to be, is there anything in there that you wish you could have rewritten now, now that it's gone to press that maybe you could take back or you could amend or add some more information to? No, I'm really happy with, I'm really happy with Body Slams. Um, the one thing that, remind, that, that I think is awesome and that is isn't remarkable to me is that people don't seem to focus only on certain parts. A lot of people tell me about different things in the book that are meaningful to them from different parts of my career. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the questions that I get asked on radio and television have to do with the more sensational and sometimes the negative side of what I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, but anyone that reads Body Slams will know it's not a slam book. There are a lot of guys that I've worked with that I, that I respect, and, that, and I say that in the book. Um, one thing that I'm really gratified by is that um, the danger with writing the truth, and a lot, of, a lot of times the truth is negative, is that for people to assume, and I think people before they read the book might assume this, that, oh, it's sour grapes. It's a guy that's not in the business anymore, and he's looking to make a few bucks from writing about these people that he worked with, and that he really never even liked the business anymore. And, that, and, and people come away saying, your love for the business exists, and it's still there, and, and it's heartfelt. And, and that's important to me because pro wrestling is important to me and still, I mean, remains that way. And, um, but I couldn't sacrifice the fear of misinterpretation for the truth. The truth was most important to me. And I just thought, let's let the chips fall where they may. Mm -hmm. um, anything that's in there that's negative, negative, um, as a result of what was witnessed and I witnessed in public settings, for the most part. Um, and, and I think I've been fair in the book. I haven't had anyone tell me differently. Mm -hmm. Is there any, uh, anything that got cut out of the book just for space limitations that you wish could have been included? Well, that, actually, I, I wrote a book and a half. And I pulled everything out that, um, that got pulled out just for space limitations. Um, but I did, in short, change the, I stay, and I stayed true to body slams. Um, one of the mistakes that people make, I think, who write, they try to um, include every little detail. And in the beginning, I started to do that. And then I stopped myself because I thought, this is 21 years. This, this is going to go on forever. And I just went to the parts of my career and to the wrestling personalities that I dealt with that were uppermost in my mind, the things that I remembered right up the top. Because I thought, well, if I'm going to remember them that quickly and that easily, they're probably the more interesting things. Mm -hmm. And if I have to start digging, then it's, they'll be boring. Um, because, and luckily, some of my favorite escapades were with people who um, most people want to hear about.
like the McMahons, like Stone Cold, like Mick Foley, The Undertaker, um, some of your real hardcore fans, Abdullah, Ric Flair. So I have road stories, you know, with all of those guys. Um, and uh, but but they were the more interesting stories. Mm -hmm. There's been a, like a lot of wrestling books written in probably like the last three years. Like, which ones have you read, and were any of them influences, or like some of the books that you read? You're like, I'm going to do it differently than that book. Um, the only books that I read before writing this book, mm -hmm. because the others weren't out yet, was an old book, which three books actually. Uh, Bruno San Martino had written an autobiography back in 1980. Um, Lou Fez's Hooker. Um, but but nothing that that pertains to um, the current climate like my book does. This book was written before Mick Foley's first book. Um, I had difficulty finding a publisher. Um, the thought uh, in the publishing community is that they have this vision of wrestling fans still, you know, of of like toothless whiskey chugging, you know, redneck tr people that live under trailers, not even in trailers. And um, corporate America still has that, that vision. I, and I don't know how. I mean, what, what Vinny has done, I mean, the number one you know, cable-rated program every week, I, I don't know how these people still have this idea. I mean, even to get tour sponsorship for the Body Slam and Book Tour, I went to hotel chains, I went to rental car agencies, and their answer to me was, wrestling fans are not our customers. I said, you've got to be kidding. Like, there were 60,000 people at WrestleMania. Where do you think they stayed? You know, <laughs> it, it, but they they do have that that perception. It, it, it exists, um, and it's and it's something when you don't have the money and the uh, the name power of McMahon, it's it's really Im next to impossible to try to break through media. Um, I've been really blessed. I, I've been uh, on this tour that that I've been on. Um, I've gone on a lot of the morning shows in cities like. Secondary cities like uh, Macon, Orlando, uh, Jacksonville, um, and, and a lot of radio shows. But um, I, I don't know if that I, you know oh, books that I've that I've written. So those are the only ones that I read before I wrote the book. They didn't influence me. It was a to totally different kind of a book. Those that I read afterwards, I read uh, Mick's first book, and I read The Rock's book, and um, might have been it. I don't that Dynamite Kids book, I think you've said. Maybe no, I didn't read that. Dynamite Kids book. Okay. No, um, and they're you know, they're fine. They're different. They're different books. Mm -hmm. um, they're personality-driven books. Um, people who read Mick's book care about what his opinions are about non-wrestling-related things. They care about who his girlfriends were when he was in high school. I personally didn't care, um, but I was really zoned in on. His, what he wrote about wrestling and what he thinks of Flair and, and that kind of thing. Um, really well written book and I'm, I'm really proud of what he's done. Um, and I think it represents wrestling really well. Um, but Body Slams is the only book that's written by somebody who's not affiliated with an organization. Everything that I knew about, that Mick wrote about, was truthful. But he had to draw lines. He couldn't step over certain lines as long as McMahon was still paying his, his freight. I mean, if he had anything that he wanted to say that would have been contrary to what McMahon wanted, he had to be really careful about that. Uh, I didn't have to be careful about it. I don't ever expect to work for McMahon. And um, if I, I mean, if, and yet, there are no, there are no permanent enemies in wrestling. Because if you're a smart businessman, it's about can you make some money? It, it's all about money. And, um, I mean, who would have thought that Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon would be working together again? Um, and probably at one time, Vinny thought that he would never work with, with uh, Hogan again. But circumstances changes and the climate changes. Um, so that if, by some chance, um, I became a, a national figure outside of wrestling because of some freak thing, it's not going to happen, but if that were to happen, um, and McMahon thought that he could make money off of what I wrote about, contrary to, you know, the things that I used, that I that I may have said that were not complimentary towards him, he'd bring me in. But it would only if he be if he could make money, um, because he's not going to mention my book. It, 
you know, it's, it would only add credence to my book. I'm the only, I was, up until now, up until this taped interview, I'm the only one that knew that the WWF ordered the book, you know, and had it sent to Titan Towers. Do you find your book in uh, competition with, uh, with the, the WWF releases? Are you, are you seeing anything from stores that would carry it saying, I already have enough books? Yeah, that's, that's bound to happen. Um, most of the people who are buyers for the bookstores don't have, don't, don't distinguish between the kinds of books that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, where a wrestling, wrestling, a book written by a wrestler that's a personality driven book is very confined to that one person's experience. Mine is also, but because it covers 21 years, and because I worked for every promoter um, in the United States at the t that were that were national at the time, it covers more wrestling personalities than any other book can. Mm -hmm. um, the Rock hasn't had that kind of experience yet. He's too young. Um, so th there's no book that's like Body Slams for that reason. So that someone who lives in Sacramento, California, someone who lives in Boston, Massachusetts, someone who lives in Dallas can identify with different things that I've written in the book. Because I've been all over the world. I've worked with thousands of wrestlers and the and, and then I don't pull any punches, so it's all there. Mm -hmm. And it's not a book about me. Who cares about me? That's not why people are buying the book. People are buying the book because I've been there, I've seen it all, and I'm honest about it. Can you tell us about any type of feedback you've received about the book from guys within the industry? Any names that have called you up and, and said, you know, good job or um, George the Animal Steel likes it. <laughs> he likes it a lot. Um, I haven't, you know, wrestling is like, uh, entertainment is like, uh, is like this where you may be on a situation comedy and work closely with the cast while it's in production. But when you're no, part, no longer part of the production or the show is canceled, everyone goes their separate ways. Um, there are guys that I still stay in touch with, but, um, you know, I don't know that they've read the book. We don't really talk about it. Did you use any guys within the industry that, before the book was released to, to edit it or, or give their comments about it? Not wrestlers, but uh, wrestling historians I did. Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, would you, could you please go through this and, and see how accurate I am with this? Yeah, because I used sources to come up with my, um, my background material in, that's in the book. Um, for instance, how many times Vern Gagne held the title, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of thing, which I wouldn't know off the top of my head. Sure. Um, but you have to be careful of these reference materials, too. So I went to a couple of reference sources, and then I, um, Tom Burke up in Massachusetts has been around wrestling forever, and he's a wrestling historian. And, and he read through some of my things, and um, wherever there was a, a correction that needed to be made, he made it. Mm -hmm. There also hasn't been any... Um, any factual problems in anybody's head, probably because we took that step. Mm -hmm. well, what do you think your feedback would have been from Buzz Sawyer if he would have had the opportunity to read this book? Um, Buzz Sawyer, that's a really good question. Um, I don't really know, I don't know. I didn't know Buzz all that well. I, I stayed away from Buzz because he was buzzed so often. And he was a, he, I, I never, felt comfortable around him because I was just afraid that anything that I could say could be misinterpreted and he could go off on me. So I really didn't know him that well, so I don't know how, how he would react. Uh, I guess it depend, would depend, perhaps, here, I'll, I'll, you're asking me a hypothetical, so I'll give you a hypothetical answer. If he had, and I would, I would have loved for this to have happened, if he had, um, was able to clean up the um, addictions from which he suffered and he read the book. I think he would have agreed with what I said because he would have had a realistic view of how he was acting and how he was mistreating people. Mm -hmm. So it's very sad that, because um, I, I believe all human beings are basically very decent, honest human beings, people, and that it's these other forces that change the way we are. So if he could have released himself from those demons, I think he would have seen it realistically, the way he was acting. In, Treating people. Uh, someone who's not, you know, in the inner circle of the of the boys, but certainly close enough to make uh, a comment about him. 
Is, do you think uh, the drugs and stuff that runs through wrestling, is, is that any more rampant than any other form of the entertainment industry? Is it a problem that's, that, it, that we should be more concerned about in wrestling, or is it just part of the entertainment industry that you just kind of overlook? Um, I think the different. I, I can't speak for all the entertainment industry because I don't know how rampant it is in all the entertainment industry. But I'll tell you that I, one of the things that's different between the use in wrestling and the use in other forms of entertainment is that um, while drug use is a seems to be a byproduct of the fast lifestyle in entertainment, a lot of the drug use that is in pro wrestling came to be because of the um, working conditions in wrestling. For instance, a guy doesn't want to lose his spot on the card, doesn't want to stop working for an injury, so he'll start taking painkillers. Mm -hmm. So in order to continue in the business, we'll do that. In order to maybe get bigger and start taking, we might start shooting up steroids. So. The drug use and other parts of entertainment I don't think are directly related to the actual form of entertainment, but in wrestling they are. And that would be the biggest. You, you got into wrestling because you were a fan. Are you still a fan today or after watching 20,000 or so matches? Absolutely. Um, there, there's the majesty of wrestling. When, when, when wrestling is executed um, properly, um, the art of the game is... See, wrestling, wrestling should be like magic. Um, you should be sitting at ringside and, and by two guys with their rest, the story they're telling in their wrestling match should take you on a roller coaster ride of emotions and should capture you and bring you to another place so that you, you're even forgetting what's going on in the workplace or, or who you came to the wrestling matches with but just so engrossed in what's happening and there's something that's really special about that and I'll always be a You've seen 20 years of uh, wrestling at its peak and, and at its valleys. And uh, what, what, do you think wrestling's going to survive in any form that we that we can see it today, 20 years from now? Or is it just something that's going to constantly evolve? Or is it something that you think that may uh, be something that we write about as part of our history? No, no, no. It'll always be there. Wrestling will always be, will always exist. Um, we can't predict what it will look like because there's so many factors that could um, influence it that we can't see, but um, it, it will exist. Wrestling is a cyclical business. It's, I think the, the rule of thumb is every six years it goes through its, its down cycle and then it, it builds itself up. Um, it may be a little less than that now because of things are quicker. Um, it, it, it will change and it will evolve. I, we, we just can't see how. Um, I, I would like to see it get cleaned up. I, I don't like a lot of the themes. I don't want the vulgarity. Um, the, um, wrestling was always violent. We always had hardcore, but it was always for a reason, and it was always used sparingly, and maybe happened three, four times a year. Mm -hmm. And our hard, hardcore matches were maybe a chain match, a cage match, uh, like the third match in, in the row of, of, of rematches. Um, hardcore championship, it's bullshit. I mean, what is that? I mean, where do you go from, from there? Um, uh, anyone who thinks that climbing to the top of uh, the high spots building here and 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 jumping headfirst onto the hood of a car has anything to do with wrestling or anything to do with any kind of an art form is misinformed mm -hmm. because any idiot can do that. That doesn't take any talent. There's no artistry involved there. Um, it's wrestling. As sitting at ringside, you should think that you're seeing something or believe that you're seeing something that's dangerous when actually there's very little that's going to come to harm to the people that are involved because they know what they're doing. But the body is just not made to do what these guys are doing. If you look at Vinny's um, roster and how many people are sidelined with injuries constantly, that, that should tell somebody something. I'm going to give you an opportunity as we close the interview to, to promote... I'm really not sure w where it's going, uh, but you're doing an audiovisual tour. Is it, w w they haven't tipped us off too much. I'm not sure how much you're going to tip us off. Um, no, well, I have uh, a couple of wrestling-related projects. One is a screenplay that I wrote called "Fall for the Dream," mm -hmm. and um, I'm 
very hopeful that it's going to be produced. It's it's a, a family oriented, but yet in the wrestling scenes, um, kick ass cool, and in the real life scenes, pretty gritty. Um, Fall for the Dream addresses the personal side of wrestling and how being involved in wrestling um, affects us personally and our relationships our, with our girlfriends and and with uh, you know wives and parents and best friends. Um, the other project which you're referring to is called Body Slams and Beyond. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my stories from Body Slams and more. And I'm going to bring them to the stage and I've put together a two-act stage presentation. It's a multimedia audience interactive um, show that's going to debut in um, shortly in, uh, in Virginia. And um, I'm going to tell, well, as I'm telling my stories, you can see giant screen video of the guys that I'm talking about. And um, some shots, some video that's never before been seen. Um, the second half of the program is going to be myself with a wrestling legend uh, who has not been named yet. And I'm going to interview him. And we're going to like reminisce. And then we're going to take the microphone and we're going to throw it out to the audience. And the people in the audience will be able to ask us anything they want. I'll probably be talking to other people, very notable people, that night live from the stage. Um, and then I also have some tour footage that's never before been seen from WCW European tours. And so you get an opportunity to see the guys. You can read about it in Body Slams, but you'll be actually be able to see them on the buses, the tour buses, on the road. And uh, it's something that's never been done before. And I, I hope that we'll be bringing it around the country. Best of luck to you. Thank you. Is there anything you want to say as an exit uh, and address to anybody who bought this video and, and of course, your book? Uh, just to close out? Yeah, I, there is. Um, a couple things. Um, first, I, I want to I wanna say to the people who have been fans of wrestling for years I, I want and, and are getting disenchanted, as I have been with a lot of the themes that are out there, um, the vulgarity and so forth, don't give up. Um, don't let that product turn you away from what we've grown up to love because we all have a bond and that bond is wrestling, pro wrestling as we know it, has affected us and has entertained us for years. Um, instead of turning off a product and never seeing wrestling again, I strongly suggest that you get out there and support your independent groups. That's the future of wrestling. That's where tomorrow's stars are going to come from. Um, and, and, and let the cycle happen. Um, things will get better, things will get closer back to the art of the game. Um, but don't let one individual take away something that you love so much. There are other places to see it. There will be other organizations that they won't be, they will not beat Vinny, but they'll be out there as alternatives. And uh, check them out. And if it's more of what you like, support them. And for sure support the local indies. The other thing that I'd like to say is just it is just totally awesome to me that someone like myself who's been known to like I said before say weights places and and wrestlers names has been taken seriously that people are reading what I'm saying and um, are responding the way they're saying the way the way the way they the way they are um, I'm totally um, overwhelmed by the response, and I want to thank the people for uh, believing that this guy, who you never knew too much about on the personal side, really had something significant to say, and I just hope and pray that I haven't disappointed you. Well, I want to thank you once again for your time, and uh, if uh, you can be reached on the internet at? 